Good morning, we welcome you to the First Congregational Church of Shrewsbury here on this 11th Sunday after Pentecost. We, gl we are glad that you have gathered with us wherever it is that you are. Um, so settle back, we'll begin with some music from the organ. All our music will be from the organ this morning, so um, what a treat. And so we'll listen um, to Curtis and then we'll come together with our call to worship. So welcome. Will you join me in the call to worship? God is in this place today. For God longs to be in relationship with us. God is in this place today. God loves the sinners and the saints. God is in this place today. Claims all, loves all. God is in this place today. So let us worship holy God.
Come join with me in our unison prayer of confession. Gracious God, Zacchaeus valued money over people and power over equality. He was a sinner, but so are we. Like Zacchaeus, we are quick to prioritize the wrong things, valuing our to-do lists over family time, our own success over a relationship with you, and wealth over generosity. We lose sight of what really matters. We lose sight of love. Forgive us for our ignorance and impatience. Call us back to the life you, lead for, you long for us to lead. With humility and gratitude, we pray. Amen. Rich, poor, young, old, sinner, saint, we are all God's children, and God transforms each of us into the people we are meant to be. Broken, we are mended. Separated from others, we are made one. Longing to serve, we are sent forth. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. So we have this story this morning, friends, about this man called Zacchaeus, and our friend um, Jen Shaw taught me the song this morning about a wee little man was Zacchaeus, I, I don't know it, and it's a story about, that we learn in Sunday school. And so what I was thinking about, actually, is that when you hear the story of Zacchaeus, Jesus teaches us that, that everyone is important, everyone is welcome, everyone is unique, everyone is different, and that God really loves all of us, no matter who we are and, and what, what we're like, whether we're tall or short. We talked about that. Rich, poor, young, old, sinner or saint, God loves us all. We're all unique. It's kind of like, um, it's hard to think about winter and snow and all of that at this moment, but you know, kind of like the beauty and uniqueness of a snowflake. Can you, can you imagine like when that first snowfall comes and it's those really, really big snowflakes, right? And, and it's so beautiful and you just run outside and you, you look up and you want to hold them in your hand and just look at them and, and sometimes you can and you hold them and this one's pretty and that one's just a little different and oh, they're, they're just so beautiful because that's how God is. God creates us so uniquely and differently and beautiful and can just transform our hearts um, when we know that that's true about everyone, when we believe that everyone is, is unique and wonderful and um, part of God's community. And so I don't know what snowflakes necessarily, if that makes sense in all of that, but uh, I thought of of snow, of snow and snow time and the beauty of, of that creation. So thank you for, for listening this morning. We're going to hear the story now of, Z of Zacchaeus in um, Luke's uh, gospel and um, take it from there and see what, what, what uh, God has to tell us in our story this morning. So thank you. So yes, this is the story from Luke's gospel um, in the 19th chapter, verses 1 through 10. Um, and so let us hear it now. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he is gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Here ends the reading this morning, and may thanks be to God. So at first glance, it doesn't appear that the story we hear this morning fits 
into the theme that we've been looking at all summer, that theme of unraveling. Who is being unraveled? Is it Zacchaeus or is it us? We've considered throughout the summer what happens when our lives are at God's people in exile. We've heard the unraveling laughter of um, Abraham and Sarah. We've witnessed the unraveling of one whose doubts impeded his ability to be fearless. We've thought a lot about what happens when our lives take an unexpected turn and begin to unravel. So this morning we hear that familiar story of Jesus and Zacchaeus, and for many of us, just hearing that, that name Zacchaeus takes us back to Sunday school or, or to vacation Bible school where we learned that song, many of you did, about Zacchaeus being a wee little man and climbing up that sycamore tree. I don't personally know the song, but I'm glad that Jen taught it to me. One would think that his stature was the most important thing about Zacchaeus, but I assure you there is much more to Zacchaeus than his height. Zacchaeus heard that Jesus would be coming to Jericho and he was so excited to have the chance to hear Jesus that he climbed up a tree and he waited for him to come down the street. And we don't know for sure what, what prompted Zacchaeus to do this. The song might lead us to believe that he had to climb a tree so that he could see what was happening because he was so short. And you know, I think of, of the, the pictures that we have of of um, the parades in Boston when the Patriots win or the Red Sox won, you know, and everyone's out there on the sidewalks, you know, 10 deep, and someone's climbed up a tree, you know, a young person probably, um, so they can see everything, you know, what's going on. So that's kind of the image that I think about when I think of Zacchaeus. And so this is where we find Jesus, and Zacchaeus literally is up a tree. Now Zacchaeus is might have been surprised that, that he was even interested in Jesus. They would have been more surprised to hear Jesus choose Zacchaeus out of everyone in that crowd and insist that he come down and they go to his home to enjoy company. And Zacchaeus does come down. Zacchaeus, come down from there, for I am going to your house today. When the people hear this invitation, they are incredulous. Why Zacchaeus, of all the people he could have chosen to go to, he chooses Zacchaeus? Sure. Jesus must know what this man is like. He's a tax collector. He cheats his neighbors. He gets rich off their suffering. They're horrified by this choice. I am going to your house today. It's as if Jesus says to Zacchaeus, I don't care what you've done, and I don't care who you are. Nothing you've done or will do will make you ineligible to receive my love and attention. Yes, I'm coming over to your house. By choosing Zacchaeus, Jesus is making this point to everyone who is there. The word that the Christian tradition has given to this indiscriminate, Zacchaeus is laced with oppression and thievery and quid pro quo, working the system to get ahead, working the system for one's own benefit in order to become richer. To heck with everyone else. People are unsettled and they're complaining because this man Zacchaeus is just no good. Come, I'm going to your house today. In that simple invitation, Jesus flipped their world upside down. Zacchaeus' response breaks every rule in their this is the way things are supposed to be playbook. They grumble. Zacchaeus is not the person Jesus should reach out to, nor the person that is worthy of so much attention. Yes, they're angry and they're jealous, and perhaps they're even small-minded. One preacher says, ironically, the name Zacchaeus means righteous which is pure irony in this story. Luke describes him as the sort of sleazeball person that we love to hate. 
He says that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. That is, he was a Jew who collected taxes from the Ro for the Roman oppressors. So he was a traitor to the political cause. Luke also says that Zacchaeus was wealthy. And surprise, surprise, how did Roman tax collectors get wealthy? By extortion and embezzlement by taking advantage of the elderly, by exploiting the working poor, and by taking care of his cronies. There's an unspoken assumption of corruption here. Indeed, Zacchaeus is a man who deserves our disdain. I'm going to your house today. Jesus unravels our expectations of who he is and who, who is in and who is not, the kinds of people with whom he chooses to associate with and save. When the religious authorities complain that Jesus is no good because he associates with tax collectors and sinners, this is who he's talking about. Jesus chooses the least appropriate people sometimes with whom to share love and fellowship, and then he tells us to go out and do the same. Don't get me wrong, tax collectors in that day were probably worthy of disdain, yet as we perhaps can hear from Zacchaeus' interchange with Jesus, there is much more to Zacchaeus than most people probably assumed. Zacchaeus is so surprised by Jesus' invitation that he boldly proclaims, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anything of anyone, I will pay for times that much. Some scholars hear this and they interpret the Greek in the present tense, not in the future as in I will do this, but that I do do this. Without fanfare or recognition perhaps, Zacchaeus is already quietly faithful and generous, something that no one might have known about him. And despite his profession, he inconspicuous, inconspicuously behaves in ways that, that are better than his neighbors who are there offering their own disdain toward him. He acts more Christian, if you will, than those who profess to be righteous and faithful. Perhaps you've come across someone like this in your own life. Why does Zacchaeus respond to Jesus' invitation this way? Well, maybe it's as simple as being seen. Maybe it's as simple as being called by name. Maybe it was as simple as being considered worthy of someone's time and attention. Because when Zacchaeus climbed that tree, he didn't expect to be noticed. In fact, he probably hoped that he wouldn't be. And perhaps he didn't care about what his neighbors thought. But he did not likely expect to have any encounter with Jesus that day. He was trusting that in that spot, high above the crowd, he could be incognito. But when Jesus stops and looks up at him and says to Zacchaeus, come down, his life unravels. They may sound like small things, but they aren't if you don't experience them. If you aren't seen, if you aren't recognized, if you aren't ever the one to be invited, no matter how old you are, it hurts. Come, I'm going to your house today. You know, Zacchaeus was likely very lonely. Who wants to associate with the tax collector, right? The crowd saw his money and his occupation and they thought they knew who he was. So often we make judgment about things of which we know so little we make assumptions about people who we don't know or don't take the time to fully understand. But I know I can fall into that trap. We hear the accusations, uh, accusations uh, every day. Oh, the liberals this, the atheists that. The Republicans this, the evangelicals that. We make assumptions about people's character and priorities the way that they live their lives based upon their vocation and the party with which they're affiliated or the organizations that they support. We think we know what we need to know about um, folks because of uh, with whom they associate. But like Zacchaeus, 
we know, may know very little about them. My colleague Cindy Maddox is thinking about this text and the whole sense of unraveling. She says, so maybe Zacchaeus's greed needed to come unraveled and maybe the people's judgment did. Look again at Jesus's response to Zacchaeus's statement. Then Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. He too. He too is part of the community because the people finally saw him for what he really was. They could welcome him back into the community. Maybe this isn't a repentance story, she says. Maybe it's a miracle story, which almost always results in the people who had been excluded now being welcomed. All are welcome. So come. Come as you are. This is what Zacchaeus hears when Jesus calls him, come as you are. I can't wait to come to your home to spend time getting to know you, to share the warmth of hospitality that I am sure you are going to offer, and to see what can come of this encounter. Being known, being named, being honored, they transform a person. And isn't that ironic? We love a surprise ending except when we're part of the story. The Episcopal priest Elizabeth Caton says several notes that there are several ironies in this story. Turns out she says that Zacchaeus does live up to his name. He is in fact the righteous one. Turns out Jesus knew that all along. And she goes on to say, Jesus is about, Jesus is once again turning our world upside down, confronting us with our assumptions about who is good and who is evil, and demonstrating for us the tricks we play in our minds before we treat one another one way or another. Like the crowd murmuring about Zacchaeus, it's easy to be blinded by our prejudice of those people and find ourselves accusing the very person or people we should emulate. So whose life is then unraveled? Isn't this the way of Jesus? One great unraveling after another. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Lose your life in order to find it. Jesus unravels perhaps our bitterness so we may see community through new eyes. So come down from there, because today I am going to your house. It's time that we get to know each other. May it be so. Amen. We come now to our time of prayer with one another, and wherever you are, I invite you to join us in our response. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, and I will go like this and invite you to join me in that refrain. So come, let us be together in the spirit of prayer. O oh, good and gracious God, you have called us to be a people of prayer, to continue the ministry of intercession handed to us by Jesus. And so we come before you with confidence, bringing our prayers for the world you love. 
We pray for those who, like Zacchaeus, are surprised by your unmerited grace. Such love and generosity transforms our hearts. We pray with those who are battered by the storms that rage around us, those who are recovering from summer storms throughout the country, from wildfires to hurricanes to, to unexpected microbursts. These storms know nothing of a pandemic. We pray for those who have lost their job, have not yet been able to find one, and have now lost their additional unemployment support, who may be threatened with eviction, or who may be waiting a COVID test result. We pray for our siblings in Beirut that continue to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives. O oh God, for all these circumstances and so much more that you know are on our hearts, we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who through these challenging times may be experiencing a crisis of faith, who long to wholeheartedly trust in God but are held back by questions and doubts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have fallen into despair, who, who doubt God's presence and power, who are overwhelmed by so many challenges of mind, body, and spirit. We pray for those, God, who live with mental illness in their lives every day, perhaps made more potent by isolation and the uncertainty of these times. Therefore, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we trust that you do not wish for anyone to suffer, and we offer our prayers for those who hunger and thirst, those who live in the midst of violence or poverty, those who feel abandoned or ignored by the world around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Through the life-giving power of your Holy Spirit, Make your sustaining presence known to all who are in pain or need so they too may know your love. And we ask that you would send your spirit to be with those in our own community whom we name this day, O oh God, for John, son of John, who has been released from the hospital, praise God, in Texas and is now recuperating in a rehab facility, getting stronger every day. For Dot and Ralph and Ray, who are recovering and gaining their strength as well. For Edwin to continue to be blessed with love and care as he faces his illness. For our teachers and administrators making difficult decisions and preparing for another school year. We lift to you, O oh God, all the friends and family who so deeply miss Liddell and Dawn and Kat, who died tragically in an automobile accident five years ago yesterday. Holy One, with great joy, we lift to you Mickey and Joe, who celebrated their marriage right here yesterday. What a joyful, joyful day it was. And we continue to lift to you those for whom we pray. Be with Nolan, Bonnie and Bill, Donald and Trudy, J. Dev, Joey, Anna, Linda, Charles, Phyllis, Chris, Gary and Barb, Sandy and Bill, Florence, Donna, Bo and their families. And be with Nancy. Be with all our military personnel, our first responders, our health workers, and, and those who protect and care for us each day. To this we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, these are the prayers of your people this day, and we offer them in the name of Jesus Christ our teacher and sibling, liberator and savior, who taught us each to say when we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the time when we would receive our offering, and as we have been um, saying for so many weeks, we thank you. We thank you for your, for your prayers, for your generosity, for your continuing to share your gifts in whatever way um, that you share them so that the ministry of this church can continue. And so as we hear the music this morning, we ask that you would just contemplate your own um, sense of giving and generosity and give thanks to God for all the blessings that are in your life as well. Let us pray. O oh God, we bring our offerings as symbols of our commitment to continue the search for peace with justice in this community and all over the world. 
We offer our gifts because we know that change is possible. And like Zacchaeus, we know that God's love can work through us, transforming and enabling us to live in God's way. So we offer our gifts for the transformation of ourselves and our world for the good and for all. Amen. I send you forth into the world with this blessing and benediction. God is the rock to which you cling your hiding place. This doesn't mean that now you should go where no one can find you. Instead, this week, I invite you, come down out of your sycamore tree because Jesus is coming to your home to the place where you work or where you learn or where you play. So don't be afraid. Today, salvation has come to this house because you too are a child of Abraham. Amen. Amen.